This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm Patrick Gulo. I'm David McDonald. I'm Sam Merciers. And I'm Nate Blyton. And our guest this week is pianist Alec Harris. Alec has performed venues around the world and is currently on faculty at the music department of UC San Diego. His new album, Vabern, Volpe, and Feldman, releases this December on Bridge Records, and we're happy he could join us today to talk about it. Alec, thanks for joining us. Thank you. So, Alec, this is an interesting uh, selection of composers. Um, could you just tell us about developing the idea for this release and why you settled on these three uh, composers and, and how you got into the project? Sure. Uh, I, the original idea was there were a couple of Feldman pieces, uh, rather late Feldman pieces, uh, that I was really interested in, in recording. Uh, so those are uh, a piece called Piano from 1977, and then Palais de Marie, which is his last piano piece from uh, 1986. And, uh, you know, usually Feldman is, is associated with Cage, but I was thinking that the music that Cage wrote at that same time in the, in the 70s, say, uh, sound, doesn't really sound at all like Feldman. I and mean, you don't hear musical connections, or I don't. And, I, and some other music that I, that I just enjoy uh, is Volpe and Weber. And, you know, in the beginnings of some of these Feldman scores, there's some writing by Feldman. He has, uh, you know, he, he wrote a lot. And in this essay, he talked about how he studied with Volpe for 17 years and didn't feel he was learning anything. And they, all they did was argue. And, uh, you know, then when he met John Cage, it was as if John Cage gave him permission to do what he wanted to do. So that got me thinking. And I realized that a lot of, a lot of the, the sounds, a lot of the harmonies in Feldman, especially late Feldman, really there's a lot of connections there in the harmonic language with Volpe, which might not be evident at first because the rate of passage, you know, the Volpe's music goes by at a kind of a clip and Feldman's music, you know, is extremely uh, spaced out and, and it's, you know, it's a uh, a lot of repetition, and it and it moves more more at a kind of more luxurious pace. But the more I thought about it, I really felt like there was there were strong musical connections there. And of course, by the time uh, by the time Feldman was at the end of his life, he really gave Volpe his due, and he wrote one of his major works uh, and called it for Stefan Volpe. And then, of course, Volpe studied with Webern. And there, I think there's another kind of philosophical or you know deeper musical connection of this kind of very refined language, you know. So, those are some interesting connections that you're drawing. Like you said, you know, when we think about Feldman, we're we're usually thinking about Cage, and the and it's it's weird because they're like you pointed out in especially in the '70s, their music doesn't sound any Cage is so spaced out and so free and open, and Feldman is so precise. Um, exactly, and, and, it, and it really it does, I think, lend itself to the the connections that you're drawing with with Volpe and and in particular Webern um, is is a really uh, interesting uh, connection because so so many Feldman albums I have have Feldman and Cage on them. Um, so, are you when you looked for these these specific pieces that you included on this album? Are you drawing any? particular connections between these individual works? Well, yeah, that's what really got me going, is when you end a work of, say, Weber, and when you end the Weber variations, that last variation is it's very minimal. It has you know, very few chords that are, that are kind of cycled around, and it's very hushed, and it's slow. And to end that piece and then start Palais de Marie... It's, they just, to me, it's, they fit together beautifully. You know, they just kind of, one melts right into the other. And I, I felt the same way with, with Volpe, you know, when I, uh, to go from the Volpe directly into uh, Feldman's piano, I just really like the connection. You know, it's, uh, there's a certain, 
it's the only diff the biggest difference is just that that uh you know the the way the the, the way the music passes you know the the rate of of activity but the language is you know there's Certain things Volpe does, he has like pairs of chords where just a few pieces, uh, interlocking pieces, will change places. And Feldman does the same thing. He just takes more time to to listen to it, you know, and he'll repeat it. So, well, it's it's interesting to me that that taking comparing Morton Feldman and Webern, um, where they might seem drastically different as far as you know. Uh, a 90 minute piece is not something you're going to hear from Bayburn. But when I listen to the music, economy of means is something that still seems very much right at the forefront when you're listening, if that makes any sense. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think Bayburn was, you know, he was an expert in uh, Renaissance music and this idea that there should not be any, any fat or excess, uh, you know, no excess material that it should be really uh, concise and I feel that way with Feldman. I think that Feldman really listened to every single chord, and it's kind of exquisitely crafted, you know? Uh, right. So, yeah. So the, the observations that you're making about this music is, is all very um, seemingly abstract and theoretical. And when I, when I think of, you know, single performer albums... I usually think of things that are very instrumental, things that are for a piano album very pianistic and and, and things like that. Uh, how how do you relate this writing, which is is very in in Webern and Feldman and, and Volpe, very um, intellectual to the the application of it, you know, to the to the piano itself. You mean the, the pianistic? Sense. Yeah, is, are are these uh, do these wor works connect to one another pianistically, technically? Um, because I, I I really like. I mean, we're composers. We love when people obsess over notes the way that we do. But I'm curious about how you relate to these works through the piano. Well, I was just thinking about how, you know, how how all three of these composers will take an interval that a dissonant interval like like a minor second or a major seventh or a minor ninth and for them it's not it doesn't feel dissonant it's it's just really uh, it's as if there's just the beauty of that sound and so i think it it's asking for a kind of playing where you're you're um you're really striving for clarity and that every chord should be clear and really carefully voiced uh and so I think that that goes across. That's a kind of a a challenge that I like. That is for all three. I think uh, playing very softly and and yet with 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 a kind of a with as beautiful as possible a sound. You know, with a lot of clarity. Is I mean that's a big challenge for Feldman. But in in Volpe too, he has these extremes of dynamics. So to be able to to go from very loud to very soft, and, and the, soft, the soft still be lyrical and still be, um, you know, with, with quality. And clearly you have that in Webern, too, you know, the same, the same thing. I mean, there are particular problems in, you know, unique to each of these composers. So, I mean, Volpe asks you to go inside the piano a little bit, just which isn't that big a deal anymore, but, you know, you have to sort of suddenly reach in and stop a note or pluck a note. And Feldman's notation is, you know, poses challenges. Uh, he has particular ways of writing rhythms, and and he asks for very, um, you know, uh, minute variations of rhythm. So you might repeat the same figure, but it, it would it will be written with a you know slightly longer durations, that kind of thing. So they all require a lot of counting. <laughs> A lot of counting and a lot of precision. The, the, so you mentioned kind of the the kind of uh, love of the abstractness of the sound. Just the the beauty of making this this sound on the piano is is a really cool idea, and I think it's something that 
at least I as a composer haven't ever really gotten over the coolness of making a sound and then putting two sounds together and then putting three sounds together and just hearing that is still very cool to me and I hope it continues to be cool for the rest of my life um <laughs> and artists it tend seem- to get bored <laughs> right sure but so watch out it seems that that's a really difficult that's a really challenging thing on the piano because it requires so much consistency with such a complicated machine of the piano um and it's one thing to do that in a recording session and you mentioned that you're going to play this whole thing in a performance and then after intermission play another 75 minutes of music that's it strikes me as a as a is a pretty amazing challenge to take on. It's a, yeah, it's mostly a, the biggest challenge is the, the concentration for yeah. sure. And, you know, as you were saying, I mean, the technical challenge, it's to, when you're counting these very precise and, and sort of difficult rhythms at the same time, you're, you have to be physically completely relaxed in order to, to play with the kind of sound you want. So, that's to get those two things happening at the same time is that's a great challenge and then you know and of course the music has to be alive so uh in the case of of feldman it's not just spaced out music it's you know it's it's music that has a backbone it's it's just you have to you have to space out your sense of time mm-hmm. but you know there is very strong time in the in those pieces and i feel like if the time is consistent if the tempo is consistent, the piece holds together. And uh, that's another big challenge. That's an interesting thing about Feldman is that, it, I mean, it's not as though you're tapping your foot to it or anything, but I think it's really clear when a performer is doing that very well, is ca- is counting that very precisely and placing all of those rhythms exactly as Feldman composed them, and when they're kind of guesstimating about where that should be and uh, really successful performances of Feldman maintain that open feeling while still being technically very precise. I think so too. How How do you strike that balance in performance to keep it feeling open and still manage to nail all of those timings as, as precisely as Feldman's written them? You know, it's just what you said. It's a balance. It's uh, you, you have to be listening really intently and listening to the sound as it decays, listening to, you know, to all the complexity of, of uh, the sustained tone. And at the same time, you've got to be focusing on, you know, on, on just on counting and rhythm. And, and uh, that's, that's the fun of it. I mean, I think uh, when I do the chamber piece, I'll be very much helped by the fact that I'm playing with these wonderful string players who I've played with for years. And, and, uh, I know that, you know, we'll, we'll be on the same, you know, we'll be in the same place. Did you mention what that chamber piece is? Uh, that's his last work, uh, piano, violin, viola, cello. Ooh. That's a beautiful, beautiful piece. I don't, I don't know if I'm familiar with it. Oh, well, I'll I'll have to (laughs) check it out. Yeah. yeah, the language is. I do enjoy quite Feldman. Similar. It's a it's a little bit like Palais de Marie, except that you've got four instruments, so you've got all this new color possibilities and uh, interplay between the instruments. Yeah, the kind of timbral counterpoint that you hear uh, in a lot of Feldman chamber music. Yes, mm-hmm. yes, and he's so this. You'll play a chord, and then these the string players will play the same chord in harmonics, and then they'll play it with straight tone. Then they'll bring it, bring in pizzicato, and so the you know, and then sometimes they'll the, the the trio will break up, so there are different combinations of you know, so, subtly shifting colors. It's it's fantastic. Yeah, that's interesting. That's one thing. I, when I try to explain to students who are always initially um, skeptical of of strange new sounds. And they say that it doesn't have melody. And I always ask them to imagine constructing a melody out of something other than pitches, as though the the main idea is 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 still a melody. In in that a melody is the thing that you're 
ear is latching on to, but you have to train your ear to latch on to those other things. And that's something that I think in some of Feldman's other chamber music that I that I've heard that he does really interestingly, just like you were saying, he constru- constructs this this melodic thing, the thing that your ear that he intends to draw your ear to is not necessarily a sequence of pitches in time, but a sequence of timbres in time or a sequence of uh, rhythmic spaces in time. And I think that's something that's really interesting. I'm definitely going to have to check out this work that, that you're playing. Sam, were you going right. to say something? Uh, uh, well, no, but I, yep. well, I have a question. <laughs> is it difficult in performance, considering it seems to me, if I, I'm not a pianist, but I'm imagining playing these different types of music, that it's like, it would be perhaps a different type of challenge, say, to play a Weber piece, a very intense Weber piece, and then switch and play an equally intense but very different Morton Feldman piece that unfolds over such a longer period of time compared to the sort of the distil- distillation of a Weber piece to the expansiveness of a Morton Feldman piece. Um, it seems like that's... Another thing that would make playing a concert like this difficult, like you feel the tension of getting ready for, and then it's over in five minutes, and then you feel the tension of getting ready for Morton Feldman, and it's over in ninety minutes. Does that ever come across as strange to you as a performer? But I think it's that's a great opportunity because if you played, if you could imagine playing, trying to play the Feldman with that same feeling that every note counts that you always would bring to Webern, then that's going to be, that's going to be a, a good thing to bring to Feldman. You know, I think to go to Feldman and say, well, it's going to be 75 minutes long, so I can let my mind sort of uh, drift a little, uh, that, that, you know, that's not going to be good. I think the whole point of Feldman is that he wants the same intensity of concentration that you would bring to, to a piece by Webern. He just wants you to do it for a long time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the music is so beautiful that, you know, that, you can live with that, it for a long time. Yeah. You know, I was thinking of metaphors for this quartet, this 75 minute quartet. It's all one movement, of course. And I was thinking that, uh, oh, I don't know. I was in Venice about eight years ago and if wandering around in, in the evening at, at nighttime in Venice, uh, you're sure to get lost, and there's this feeling of being disoriented and not knowing exactly where you are, uh, and yet it's just so beautiful, and you know that you're not, you know, you're not in danger. And uh, I, I feel like listening to these long Feldman pieces could be a little bit similar. You know, it's just very beautiful. You might be a little disoriented, uh, even lost, but in a pleasurable way. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So you were also a champion of uh, works by Carter and, and Har- Harrison Burt Whistle and uh, a number of 20th century composers, 21st century composers. Uh, how do you, uh, how, what, you also perform works, you know, the classical works, romantic work, compare to your, the work that you do with your more, the newer music that you perform. Does it kind of take a back seat or, um, or do you give like, you know, equal amount of time to, to, to performing these works? Uh, well, for me in my life, I, I, I see them as equal. You know, I've always played the standard repertoire. I've always played, you know, Chopin and classic piano music. Um, but, uh, you know, I remember in the 70s, the, the uptown and downtown camps were so uh, rigid and there was so much animosity among some of the composers uh, but the people like me who were you know playing uh, we never really felt that way mm-hmm. so even though I wasn't playing so much in the downtown scene I, I was always interested in that music and uh, when I came out to San Diego there's a lot of Feldman done here and I you know I was I had done Feldman all along you know I, uh, but I hadn't played these longer pieces so uh, it, it wasn't really that that big a stretch to you know to expand into that mm-hmm. right right and i think that one of the nice things about recording these kinds of works as opposed to other kinds of works is that there aren't a lot of recordings available of this stuff in in a lot of ways you're you're giving 
this this thing to the community of people that love this kind of music that they didn't have before and if you were to record other kinds of rep you'd be just adding another your your interpretation of this other thing which isn't invaluable but i would argue that that this recording is is more valuable because it is more unique well you like to think you know i to to go to the effort of recording something i i always like to think that you know that i i will play it in a way that's that's different from right. what's already out there and certainly in the case of this feldman piece piano uh you know there's that particular problem posed by the score where you're you're just in the normal two staves for a couple of pages and then suddenly there are four staves and you're basically looking at a two piano piece mm -hmm. and my understanding is what i think most pianists have done is just slow down and put the pedal down and jump back and forth uh which mm -hmm. is you know one way to to approach it but i just thought about it and you know there's a piece by feldman called three voices where he says you can pre-record two of the voices and sing the the third voice live and I, the, the more i thought about it i just felt like that was the the solution i wanted to use here where i would pre-record one or two piano parts for these brief multiple piano sections because the way he wrote the piece is very precise with the uh, pedal and articulation so you have you know the the piece begins almost completely unpedaled and by the end it's there are very long pedals so it just gets wetter and wetter in 22 minutes and the, these places where the the piano multiplies and you have a two or three pianos you know it's it's um it's material that's come for instance there's a place where you have the second third and fourth line of the whole piece uh, uh several minutes into the piece all three of those lines happen simultaneously and so if i pre-record i can play them you know with all of the the rests and silences and pedals and articulation that are, you know and and correct rhythm so i i just sort of feel like that the what he's doing compositionally is is i hope going to be more clear but we'll see yeah well <laughs> We, instead of waiting until the end to, to play the recording as we normally do, since we're talking about it so precisely, let's let's listen to a little bit of this. Um, this is from the, the middle of that piece, um, and we're going to get in right before this, this overdub comes in. Um, so this is an excerpt from Feldman's Piano, played by uh, our guest, Alec Karras, on his new album. So here we go.
That was an excerpt from Morton Feldman's piano performed by uh, our guest, Alec Karras. Alec, thank you so much for sharing that with us. And I can I cannot imagine now hearing that performance of it, hearing it with someone just pedaling through the whole thing and jumping back and forth. That's it's a it's a really uh, a really amazing thing. Thank you thank you so much for sharing that with us. Thank you. Um, Thanks. So, are there any? Do, is this performed that way ever with with either a second pianist or or anything like that? Not that I know of, and it's really not performed much at all. In any case, that's really so. That's I think that would be an interesting thing is to to get this experience live. That's it's a, it's a strange thing to we normally think of classical recordings as recorded performances uh and and you've taken the the studio as instrument approach that we normally associate with with popular music it's a very cool idea but it it means that when i perform the piece live i i need speakers yeah on the stage oh so that but, you you play the you play back yourself recording okay. yeah so i yeah i wow. think it's a say it's a 22 minute piece that has less than 2 minutes of this happening or maybe three at the most. So to have three pianos on the stage would just be not practical. Yeah. That seems like but quite that, a technical challenge to line yeah, that up. Yeah, but to have two little speakers, and then I've got these sound files all queued up on Super Collider, so I just need somebody <laughs> sitting on my with my laptop, and they just tap on the space bar, and there it is. So the the tape can be brought in. I mean, the tape, the, the, the recorded tape. sound yeah, right. can be brought in you know, perfectly in time. And because yeah. it, sometimes it comes in in weird places, it's uh, you know it's it's not straightforward. Yeah. Does the Super person getting space bar on the laptop get paid union scale for that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a good question. Yeah, I think it's more of a kind of grad assistant position. That one. I think so. That sounds like the perfect job for a grad assistant. Yeah. Where, where the the only thing they can do is sit there and be nervous for how many ever minutes before it's time to hit the space bar. Yeah, it's like being a page turner. Yeah, exactly. you you can only yeah. screw it up if you do it right. Nobody will ever notice you, but if you screw it up, everyone will point and laugh. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's a horrible job. You have to follow the score, and you know you've got five taps, and that's your entire. It's like playing the triangle in an orchestra. Right. Exactly. So, Alec, are you planning on taking this concert around the country to other places? Right now, I don't have other other uh, concerts planned, but I do want to repeat this program uh, in other places. So that's something. Well, it would I'll just be a next. shame to not to not spread this live music around some other places. If if well, I could squeeze some music out of my department, I would get you to to come here, but I doubt it would happen. <laughs> well, I'm cheap. <laughs> <laughs> very well i have to talk to my department as well so i know this is a bit like talking about the 2016 election right after the last election happened but <laughs> you you have such interesting recording projects i was wondering if you have uh the if you're gestating a new idea for a, your next recording project well if you were to guess i i think i would stump you all because uh, huh? it's, uh, it's, of all things, it's uh, piano music by uh, Poulenc. Mm. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, I'm, a bit, I'm a fan of Poulenc because um, I'm a clarinet player, or as I, I say, I'm uh, in recovery. I used to be a clarinet player. <laughs> Fully in remission. I'm, I'm, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, he has a, a sonata for clarinet that is very nice, but he has a, a really beautiful piece that's a sonata for two clarinets. It's one B-flat and one A. That unless you're a clarinet nerd, most people don't know it, but it's a very beautiful piece. And that led me into listening to quite a few of his pieces. And so I'm, I'm a fan. Yeah, he has great songs. And uh, I hadn't played his piano music. Years ago, I played the uh, harpsichord concerto. And so, uh, you know, my, my, uh, my friend in New York and my teacher, uh, William Daglian, who I studied with, uh, years ago, sort of said, well, why don't you just take a look at some Poulenc? <laughs> hmm. And it just, uh, it just felt right. I don't like all of his piano music, but I, I like a lot of it. And it's, uh, 
I think it's. I think he's underrated. I think he's he's got a great gift. Cool. So, so more Poulenc. Yeah, <laughs> I was wondering about this as we were talking about uh, your process of uh, recording this and preparing for the performance of these pieces and everything. And it sounds like, I, and just looking at your bio, you've recorded so many different composers and different in different styles of classical music and different contemporary things. Um, I was wondering if there were any particular challenges uh, different from the preparation that you go through for performing, but any challenges with recording these composers on this album or anything that came out of the process that was interesting to you? Uh, well, what, what I, recording the Webern and the Volpe, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's just a, a pleasure because I come to New York and, uh, my old teacher is Axis producer, so it's somebody I completely trust and who's in there. And, uh, you know, he knows me so well that he's, he's able to say, you know, time for a break and, you know, this isn't working. And uh, when it is working, you know, he's, he's a great, you know, cheers me on. Yeah. And I have a wonderful engineer who, who, again, I just, I really like the sound he gets and he's so meticulous. It's Jonathan Schultz. So that's all fine, but recording that the piece that you played the clip of uh, piano was a new thing for me. I've never recorded with overdubbing, so I had to record the, you know, record that in in layers, and uh, you know, and then record obviously with with myself, so with uh, with headphones, right, and. Uh, Normally, you know, recording with headphones is just terrible because you can't hear yourself. But what he did is he he had the feed, so I was hearing myself through the headphones. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's still it, that was that was difficult. Yeah, it's not yeah. a thing that, that that classical musicians ever really trained to do the way you know popular musicians are doing things like that all the time, and it's 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 you know weird for them to play without any kind of feedback in into their ears. And Much less like a click right. track or something. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, well, a click track would have certainly uh, made it a lot simpler. But That's I, just cheating. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. I resisted that. Uh, you, you lose as much as you gain, I think. Yeah, I yeah. Think that's right. Well, I think... Well, then it all evens out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, um, let's move on to some of the uh, the stories that we pulled for this week. Um, Alec, if you have any thoughts on any of these, feel free to uh, to jump in. Uh, first of all, do you use do you use IMSLP with your students, <laughs> Alec? <laughs> no. Do you, you know what you know what we're talking about? No. Oh man, this is a great this is a great resource. Um, IMSLP, the Internet Music Score Library Project, has all kinds of um, public domain engravings of public domain. Uh, music. So these these old, you know, Breitkopf and Hartle engravings from the 19th century of Bach and Beethoven and and and, and, and the, a lot of great music is there for free in PDF form. So if obviously there's a lot to be said about modern uh, scholarly editions, but if you're not, you know, at the point where you can spend, you know, sixty bucks on the latest most scholarly edition of whatever 19th century master work you you want to perform this is a really great resource it's also a great resource for uh theorists that want to study massive things and or, or take a quick look at something to see if that's what they want to pick up um there was a scare this week they their site was down and i know a lot of theory teachers and, and theory students that rely on imslp they were they were down and uh people in doing Google searches about, oh my gosh, what's going on with IMSLP, found this letter from 2007 about a cease and desist that they had gotten from Universal Edition um, because they had put up, um, and this is kind of a confusing thing uh, about score copyrights, is that there's a copyright on the composition and then there's also a copyright on the engraving of that composition. And so there's uh, some confusion if you aren't aware of that, you might assume that this work by Beethoven is free for you to do whatever with. Um, but if it's a recent 
engraving by Universal Edition, then you're violating their copyright. So anyway, there was a cease and desist, and there was a time at which uh, the IMSLP project looked like it was going to go away, and that letter is still published on the internet, because the internet (laughs) is forever. Um, So... A lot of people freaked out and thought IMSLP was going away. You're, you're not telling the story right, Dave. I might not. Did I? What did I mess up, Sam? The whole controversy. I I, I can't prove this, but my my sincere feeling. <laughs> All is right. That the I don't have the, the facts storm, to back this up, but let me let me tell you the story anyway. <laughs> the center of the storm was friend of the show Rob Deemer posted on his Facebook page the letter, and I saw that. Now, this coincides with a coincidence <laughs> in which IMSLP was migrating to new servers. They are now so, migrated and they're totally stable. Yes, yeah. and I use this for my class, so I was in a panic. So before I noticed that the letter was from 2007, I thought I saw, oh no, IMSLP is down. I visit IMSLP and IMSLP is in fact down. And this starts a chain reaction on the internet. And and I'm here to tell you that it's all Rob Deemer's fault is what I'm getting at. <laughs> it's all Rob Deemer's fault that the panic started, and uh, and it happened to co- or he might have found the letter because he saw MSLP was down or whatever. But so a lot of people went from screaming in terror to, to oh thank goodness, and you know it only lasted like a couple of hours, but it was pretty funny. So if you I don't mean, use I, I, IMSLP now, you should start IMSLP.org. Um, and, uh, you'll, you'll find their, their resources invaluable. I think I had pulled up my syllabus and started figuring out how, what I was going to have to do already before I realized it was a, a, a Jeez, false what alarm. Would, what would teachers do if there was no IMSLP? I don't know. I remember we what used happened? to tell our students like you, for class, you need to go to IMSLP and print off this Mozart sonata for, and bring it to, to, to class tomorrow. So you so we can talk about it in class. I don't know what would have happened if that was the plan for the next day and IMSLP went down overnight. That would have been a big problem. Mm. Yeah. Well, what what has every theory professor done before IMSLP? Well, you just go to the library, but (laughs) it's much harder to distribute that than it is to distribute the IMSLP PDF link. That's correct. Anyway. You don't live in caves anymore. Right. Anyway, that problem is solved. That problem is solved. (laughs) New yep. problems yet to be solved. German orchestras. We talked a few weeks ago about a, a nationwide orchestra strike. Orchestra musicians all over Germany walked out because of cuts to the the budgets for state orchestras, state state funded orchestras in Germany. They had been cutting back the number of orchestras over a number of years, and this past week saw a big backlash to the closing of one orchestra in particular. It's a little bit hard to follow because the orchestras in Germany have these rather arcane names that have to do... Because they're all... It's a very strange bureaucracy, or it's a very complex bureaucracy, I should say. And maybe foreign. They drill perhaps. down to what's well, I, I, I strange is, is the wrong word, but it is complex. They're, they drill down to these different districts and counties and cities all having their own little orchestras. And it's, it's just a really beautiful, great system uh, and is a, a wonderful way to support the arts. Um, but there was one particularly alarming cutback that a lot of, especially people, composers that are in, and, and others that are interested in new music found alarming when uh, the Southwest radio, German radio orchestra at Baden-Baden and Freiburg, which is not an orchestra that we hear a lot of recordings from, but they are a very important orchestra. They've, uh, in their past, recorded premieres by Hans von der Henze and uh, Luigi Nono and Olivia Messian, and they've got this great history of supporting new music, and they were being merged with another orchestra nearby, the, the Radio Symphony Orchestra of Stuttgart, and merged is not really the right word. They were kind of being cut and then the the new system was going to say this this orchestra in Stuttgart now counts for the orchestra in this larger region, and so they were getting rid of this orchestra that had this great history. And Pierre Boulez has a, a home in the area and was was a, an active part of this orchestra. And so this week, in a, a local paper in the area, 
there were two open letters published in the paper. One uh, was signed by 160 conductors that had ties to the orchestra, and another by 148 composers that all were were in opposition to the closing of this particular orchestra. I don't know if that's going to have any effect, uh, but... We we shall see. There are mixed reports, and I don't know why this is such a difficult thing for people to gauge, but any time we talk about these kinds of stories, it seems like half of the argument is about the truthfulness of the financials that are published by the orchestras and the musicians. Everybody half, is just like, no, nah, it's don't not agree. that bad. It's, it's just the same thing that when you turn on cable news in the U.S., the people don't agree on the basic facts on the ground of the situation, and therefore we can't really have a reasonable conversation about how to deal with those facts. Mm-hmm. Half of the people say, this orchestra is doing great. They're bringing in plenty of money. And the other half of the people say, this orchestra is completely destitute, and if they're not shut down yesterday, then we're going to lose a billion dollars and have to kick everybody off of our state health care system. It, there's, and there's no middle ground. I don't understand how we have these conversations. We have the same conversation in Minnesota about whether well, just, they can afford to have an orchestra or whether that orchestra is doing great. I don't understand. Another reason to advocate for uh, Drew McManus's, I can't remember the name of his project, but basically the Transparency and Orchestral Funding Project um, that we'll he's see. pushing and trying to make happen. We can hope. Yeah. A boy can dream, Sam. (laughs) He's basically trying to make um, the financial um, records of orchestras searchable um, so that the the documents are public in that they're available, but you've got to be some sort of a library hound and a specialist in that kind of thing. To track them all down and To make any sense out of it, but this is going to make them keyword searchable so that people, when people want to argue about this kind of stuff, you can actually dig down and find the facts for yourself and, well, you can, and, and know what you're talking about. You can look at it. It's usually a behind, but um, I don't know if you guys have ever um, used guidestar.org. Right. Um, so you, they, uh, I think it's what, Form 990? That yes, are, that's, uh, the one that, that's the one that, uh, I don't know what the form is called, but that's the thing that uh, Drew is trying to compile and make more public and things right. like yeah. that. So any nonprofit um, in this country, uh, in the United States at least, uh, you know, will be on there, and you can look up their their financials. Yeah, I mean that, 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 that's that, not the that he's saying it needs to be, he's wanting to make it keyword searchable. Well, right, right. and it's that's not, not going to solve our Germany problem either. Alec, no. have you ever? Do you have any ties to these orchestras in Germany? I everyone that I've talked to that has worked with these state orchestras in in Germany and state opera as well has had a really life changing experience. All the all the Americans that have to deal with the way orchestras are structured in the United States when they go and visit these German systems are just blown away by the support that they get from the German government and the relationships these people have with their local communities. Have you, have you experienced this? Well, I haven't played with those orchestras, but I know that, yeah, it's, it's, uh, there are things that they take for granted over there that, that we just don't have. Well, like healthcare. <laughs> right. Well, and, and, and the, the way that the orchestras are structured with these regional ties i think is really key to their success is that they've got such a strong relationship with their local communities exactly um, yeah so anyway that's that's it's it's an interesting story and we'll have to keep an eye on it and see if these these letters have any effect on the people that make these decisions i, I hate to say it but i'm a little pessimistic that they will <laughs> um we also saw this week carolyn shaw's Partita for Eight Voices, the piece that won the 2013 Pulitzer Prize in music, which is an amazing... Youngest awardee ever. Say what? Youngest awardee ever. Yes, she was 29 years old when she won the Pulitzer Prize. So nice. uh, it's kind of amazing. And she won it for this work for Eight Voices, and it received its premiere recording on New Amsterdam Records. New Amsterdam is hosting... or hosting holding their uh, 2013 fundraiser right now. And if you're weirded out by a record label holding a fundraiser, keep in mind, New Am is a nonprofit. Um, 
but they are are doing this really cool event on the web around their fundraiser where they're doing remixes of their premiere recording of Carolyn Shaw's Partita for Eight Voices and they are they've got eight remixes scheduled they're going to release them each Wednesday the first one just came out this past Wednesday they're going to stream them on WQXR's blog and on Q2 radio and they are also giving access to stream and download them on demand to people that contribute to their 2013 fundraising campaign. So if that sounds like something that is of interest to you, and if you are listening to the sound of my voice, the chances are that it is interesting to you. <laughs> you should check them out. We'll have a link to where you can do that in our show notes at soundnotion.tv slash SN. Very cool project uh, connecting the worlds of classical and popular music, which in a lot of ways this work was already doing. It has these really interesting connections to square dancing and country music and different kinds of folk music from around the world just by the vocal techniques what do you think sam this is i know remixing is your thing i know you're a fan of remixes well we should mention it's lorna dunn is the first uh, yes. composer mm-hmm. a a uh, bandmate of friend of the show missy mazzoli um <laughs> who has her own ep out released in october Miami Sphere, which I haven't heard, yeah. but uh, I see this is great for her too because I'm going to have to check that out now. Yeah, um, I just I just got it. I, I'll sh- <laughs> share oh, yeah? my thoughts with you soon. Okay, um, I think this is a great project, um, and it's a great idea. And you said uh, if it seems weird that a record label hold a, a fundraiser, they are a nonprofit. And remember that they were also their brand new office space was flooded out by uh, um, Sandy last. Was it? Yeah, their new. It was. It was an office slash recording studio slash performance space. It was this amazing new multi-purpose thing that they had created, and it was totally destroyed. It was very literally just finished, and it was ravaged by the storm. Um, I'd like to point out that just regarding the piece, the room full of teeth piece, Carolyn Shaw's Partita. It's not just that it connects uh, art music and pop music in the way it sounds, but to me, according to Carolyn Shaw herself, it very much does so in the way it was composed. I don't think anybody in the group would right. would not want her to have credit for the piece, but in the same way that a band works on a piece where one guy might have an idea, but then the band turns it out and develops the ideas, and also specific things are, it's not like you Person write... Person specific. It's not like, yeah, it's not the composer deep in thought, scribbling instructions on a piece of paper and that they workshop together based on what the individual band members are capable of doing. Yeah. It's, you know, and one the, guy's and, like, hey, I can do this, this multiphonic singing thing. And they're like, cool, let's put that in. And yeah. stuff like that, uh, which is, it contributes to a piece that is very unlike anything that I've ever heard before. A lot of people when it was first released and first announced, we're throwing out these comparisons to Berio's Symphonia. And a lot of that, I think, is warranted. But just the vocal technique that is thrown into it, the variety of vocal sounds, is like Berio's Symphonia, only more so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's a very cool piece. If you haven't heard it yet, definitely listen to it. And then contribute to the new Amsterdam fundraising campaign, and then listen to these remixes, the first of which was excellent. Any other thoughts? Um, every Wednesday. Every Great Wednesday, weeks. tune in. Exactly. And, and uh, as, soon as, as soon as they are posted each week, I believe they're available for purchase on the website. Yep. At, on New Amsterdam's website. So, very cool. Very cool stuff. Um. Last, we have some sad news. Uh, we lost this week uh, one of the great uh, British composers of the, of the 20th and 21st century, John Tavener. Um, Sam, you had some thoughts on, on Tavener er- earlier before we started the show. Do you want to share those with us? He, we should say he, he passed away at age 69. He was still writing up until the end. In fact, he passed away on Tuesday this week. His last completed work was premiered on Friday, it had already been yeah. scheduled for months, and this concert turned into kind of a de facto memorial. And it was, a, by by all accounts, a very beautiful and, and moving performance. 
of a number of his works and, and the works of some other composers as well. Um, Sam, what were you saying about him earlier? Well, um, my sister-in-law is a rabid Beatles fan, so the only way I have this information is because of her. Um, John Tavener's break as a composer, as far as first had his first big break of having a piece recorded, was The Whale, and it was recorded by Apple Records, uh, the Beatles label that they had in the UK. And this came about because John Tavener's brother was a carpenter, and he was doing work at Ringo Starr's house, told mm-hmm. Ringo Starr about his brother's music, and Ringo got into it and started listening to it and dug it, and that led to them recording The Whale at Apple Records. So if you're not so, that's very cool. It, it, and that makes sense. I mean, Tavener is very accessible. He's mm-hmm. part of this kind of sort of he gets described as minimalist a lot i'm not sure that that makes sense to me maybe just i associate minimalism more with the american sound of minimalism than the yeah. european arvo pert uh goretzky kind of minimalism thing the, the religious minimalists well, sure if you absolutely must <laughs> um and, and we should say though that is one of the things that in particular taverner is, is particularly well known for is his religious works and and when i think of taverner in particular i think of his choral works um which are which are very very beautiful and really approachable and not um when I say when I say accessible, a lot of times when we talk about accessibility on the show, we're, we mean that as a as a dig. <laughs> but I don't mean that in the sense of Tavener's music. It, there is it is still very thoughtful and thought provoking in in its accessibility. Um, so I I've been listening to a lot of Tavener this week, and you should check some out. We'll have some links to some some Tavener stuff in our uh, in our in our show notes as well. Do you have any any thoughts on Tavener that you want to share, Alec? You know, I really, I've never played his music, so uh, I don't don't know it that well. But I mean, it's, uh, it's a name that's been out there for quite a while. I, I guess it was Orthodox. He he became a Russian, Russian Orthodox. Orthodox right? Yeah, he yeah. converted to Russian Orthodoxy, and and he became particularly well known after one of his compositions was played. He's kind of a popular uh, figure, <laughs> is in as much as composers become popular figures. Um, and Patrick, you pointed this out that he was on the front page. His, his death was on the front page of a lot of, uh, British news services. And I think in, in a lot of that is due to the fact that he, one of his works was performed at, uh, Princess Diana's funeral. Her memorial service included a, a performance of his work. Song for Athena, I believe it is. Something. Right, something like that, or Athene, or I, I don't remember the the title, but it was something like that. It was a memorial song that he'd written for a friend that was kind of repurposed for uh, Lady Di's memorial service, and a lot of people really latched onto it at that point, and and from there found their way into the rest of his oeuvre. But anyway, it really, is a beautiful piece of music, though. I mean, absolutely, um, I was listening to it this morning. Yeah. You get to the end, and it just turns this glorious, like, scalar up and down with big, big, grandiose major chords, full chorus. It's great. Yeah, very cool stuff. So he will certainly be missed, but his music is going to be around for a long, long time. Uh, and that's going to do it for this week's Sound Notion. We already we, we, we would do our pick of the week here, but we've already given it to you because we care about you, and we don't want you to have to sit around and listen to us blather about things you don't care about when you could be listening to the music of Mort Feldman. That's, that's how much we care. Before we go, um, Alec, do you have anything coming up that you want to plug? We've talked about some things. We always like to give one like last chance to plug anything at the end. Do you have anything coming up? Well, just uh, anybody who can come to Merkin Hall on 67th Street in New York on December 8th, 730, uh, that's, that's my Feldman show. So We expect you to be there, Patrick. <laughs> I, will, I will see if I can make it. I, I, I should be around, I think. Yeah. Well, come and say hello. I Excellent. I will. Excellent. Um, so if you would like to read about any of the stories that we talked about this week on the show, you can check out our show notes. We'll have links to all of that stuff. You can also comment on the show at soundnotion.tv slash SN. Thank you to everyone who watched live and joined us in chat. You can do that every week. We do the show 
Record it and stream it live every Sunday morning around 11 a.m. Eastern Time. So you can join us at soundnotion.tv slash live for that. If you'd like to contribute to this conversation after the show, if you have any thoughts you'd like to share about John Tavener or about Morton Feldman uh, or about Carolyn Shaw's remixes or the history or the history and future of German or American orchestras, we'd love to connect with you on all the social media things. We do Facebook and Twitter and YouTube. You can subscribe to us, like us, and follow us and do all those internet-y things there. Um, you'll find links to those on our site as well. Um, you can subscribe to this show and all our shows at Town Notion TV in the iTunes store, including our newly launched with Nate Blyton and Ben Furman show about electronic music called Patch In, just launched this week. Congratulations, Nate. We look forward hey. to that. Um, so if, if you're into electronic music and you would like to learn more about what's going on, uh, I would certainly encourage you to check it out there. Um, if you'd like to support our show, you can do so using the links on our site. On the right side of the site, there's a Amazon search box. We get a commission for you using that. So when you're doing your holiday shopping, if you just search for the thing that you're already going to get using the little box on our site, it doesn't cost you anything more, and it looks identical to you after you get to Amazon. But we Especially get a all tiny those little big commission. Tablets that you're planning on buying. Yeah, all those all those Kindle Fires and things like that, and whatever. Right. I don't know what are the things that people are buying. The, your your tickle me Elmos, your tickles me Elmo, um, whatever whatever the hot thing is, are the are Furbies still a thing? Those two, um, oh, yeah. so we appreciate I think that. Like seven years behind, right? I'm you know whatever. There's nothing wrong with a Furby, except it's super creepy. Yeah, um, except all the things. About ex- a except Furby. it's super creepy, and you shouldn't feed it after midnight or get it wet, or it will something terrible will happen to you and your family. Right. Sound Notion's introduction includes music by Patrick Gula and video by Tyler Lepp. Thanks again for watching, and we will see you back next week.